snap. The kick is in the air, and the kick this time is no sir Ree. No sir Ree. Final score, Tennessee 20, Florida 17. Pandemonium reigns. You're listening to the RTI Podcast, powered by WalkingTopInsider.com. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the RTI Podcast. I am Nathaniel Rutherford, the managing editor of RockyTopInsider.com, joined again, as always, by Ben McKee, our staff writer here at RTI. He is also the co-host and producer of the Swain Event Morning Sports Talk Radio Show. We appreciate all of you tuning in for another episode here. If this is your first time listening to the RTI podcast, welcome in. We appreciate it. You can find our podcasts in a multitude of ways. You can subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts if you have an iPhone or uh, use you know iTunes or anything like that, or I guess iTunes is going away, but whatever it is, you can subscribe to us at Apple Podcasts. If you have an Android phone, you can find us in whatever podcaster app you use on there. We're on YouTube. Just search Rocky Top Insider on YouTube, or usually uh, there are links to it in articles, and it'll be linked to it on the article where this one's embedded in. And speaking of that, if you go to RockyTopInsider.com, click on the podcast tab on the homepage, you'll see articles uh, with all our podcasts embedded in there. You can listen to those podcasts straight from that webpage, or watch the YouTube video from there as well, or you can download the podcast from that webpage as well. Well, Ben, we have a lot to talk about and a lot of positivity. This this will be probably the, the most positive podcast we've done this season because, as I mentioned in the post-game show uh, on Saturday, that second half was, in my opinion, the most dominant second half I've seen Tennessee play since Florida 2016. I mean, that, that game, Tennessee came out and scored 35 unanswered points against Florida in that second half, and they just were, you know, took the Gators to the woodshed. In this game, scored 24 unanswered points against South Carolina, uh, took the Gamecocks to the woodshed, didn't allow them to convert a single third down. I think the Gamecocks were like one of four on fourth downs as well. Uh, held them to 58 yards total offense in the third quarter. Tennessee comes out, scores on offense, scores on special teams. Uh, they, they were fantastic on defense. It was a complete team effort. They dominated South Carolina in all three phases. Ben, before we kind of get to more of the meat of the podcast, I, I think this is, to me, that was easily, you know, you can you can look at the, the win against Auburn, you can look at the win against Kentucky, and, and this year the win against Mississippi State. I would contend, though, that I know South Carolina's not a world beater. I know they aren't a ranked team like Auburn and Kentucky were last year. I would still contend, though, that with the way they played, I mean, the first half wasn't a bad half either. Um, but, you know, that, where that Florida game, that first half, Tennessee was down 21-3. to three. First half against South Carolina, Tennessee was exchanging blows. And if not for that 75-yard touchdown on the first play, I mean, Tennessee would have to, would have had the lead at halftime too. But I, I, I think this game, of any in the Pruitt era, I think that this game, like I said, before we get to the meat of the, the topic here, that to me was the most impressive game I've seen Tennessee play in the Jeremy Pruitt era. No, most definitely. Uh, I, I would maybe say our Auburn of last year, mm-hmm. uh, or, or actually I would probably say Kentucky of last year uh, would be possibly my number one. I'd have to really sit and think about it. But just off the top of my head, I do think that Kentucky football team from last year was better than this South Carolina team. Mm-hmm. And just kind of the way my brain works, I just tend to, t- tend to just give the nod to – you know which team was better in terms of gauging the the importance of the win. I would probably say Kentucky because even at that time Tennessee was also fighting for a bowl game, just like Tennessee is this year. Uh, that Kentucky team is better than uh, last year's Auburn team, in my opinion, and this year's South Carolina and Mississippi State team. Uh, and on top of that, uh, Tennessee also physically dominated Kentucky in that football game just like they did on Saturday against South Carolina. So I'm not trying to take anything away from, from this year's win, but I think I would give the nod in, in that one. There there were better individual performances on Saturday against South Carolina, but as a team, uh, I, I do think the, the better performance was against Kentucky last year, just simply because they were, last year's Kentucky team was better than this year's South Carolina team. But that's not to take anything away from Saturday's performance. It was absolutely dominating. Uh, Tennessee 
you know, whipped a good South Carolina offensive line in terms of Tennessee's defensive front. I did not see that coming, which is why uh, part of the reason why I predicted ten or predicted South Carolina to win, and then another reason why I kind of picked South Carolina to win be- was because I did not expect Tennessee's quarterback room to play as well as they did. And if I remember correctly, that was kind of like the first sentence of my prediction, saying that I'm the the basis, the the foundation of me picking South Carolina is because I don't trust Tennessee's current quarterback situation. Uh, I, I didn't necessarily think that they would play terrible against South Carolina. I did not expect them to throw for a season high 319 mm-hmm. yards, and or it was 351 yards. I'm actually shorting them, um, but and then not only season high in passing yards, but a season high in total total offense as well. 450 something yards of total offense. Uh, I've got the stats right here in front of me. I couldn't remember it off the top of my head. 485 total yards of offense. So it was a dominating performance. Jawan Jennings played the the game of his career. You know. The, the the plays that we remember about Jawan are in the Florida game uh, back in 2016 uh, when Tennessee finally broke the streak. But I think Saturday was the most complete game he's ever played, just not only as a receiver, but other ways he impacted the game. You saw him obviously in the Wildcat, had a couple of successful runs, uh, even <laughs> completed a pass, even though it may have been an ill-advised pass. He kind of had already made up his mind and – just was going to throw it regardless, but threw it into double coverage, and Callaway was able to make a great catch, and obviously that came back on a penalty because Brandon Kennedy was too far down the field, but just in terms of how much Jawan impacted the game at quarterback, uh, at, at wide receiver, two touchdown catches, and two touchdown catches in, in which he was just just proved that he's the most competitive player in the entire country, in my opinion. Obviously that is that is a hard you know accolade to to just quantify but Mm -hmm. to me it's going to be hard to find another college football player that's more competitive that's tougher than Jawan Jennings and I thought those two touchdown catches really illustrated that so and even on top of the performance on the field you know at quarterback at at receiver how about his leadership there's a video going around on Twitter of when Jameer Johnson had his false start and Jawan kind of walks over to him and kind of calms him down and says, it's okay, let, let, let's go. Like, that's tremendous leadership. So not only from a performance standpoint, but from a leadership standpoint, I thought Saturday was Juwan's most complete game. I thought Daniel Batuli was just an absolute wrecking ball, uh, and he was just tremendous. Nigel Warrior, he has continued to really improve game to game to game, uh, and he made several nice, open field tackles that we have not seen Nigel Warrior make those tackles in the past. So uh, Saturday consisted of the most individual performances in the Jeremy Pruitt era. Um, but as a from a team standpoint, I still, I still give a slight nod to that Kentucky game last year just because that was such a physical punch-you-in-the-mouth Kentucky football team. And not only were they physical, but, I mean, they had a ton of talent. And Tennessee was just able to – to, to just whoop them that day and you know it did not look like the Kentucky football team that we were used to last season and Tennessee was the physical you know the, the superior team in terms of physicality in that game they were tougher in that game and that was not anything else you saw from Kentucky in any of their other games last season so in terms of how many individual performances we saw on Saturday you got to give the nod to the to the South Carolina game but I'm, I'm still giving that Kentucky win um, the nod as the most impressive win of the Jeremy Pruitt tenure. I think it's fair. I didn't, like you say, it, it was against the top 15 team, and I think that's obviously optically always going to look better uh, than being an unranked team at, at home or, or whatever. But but I, I do agree with you talking about just kind of the performances and stuff too um, from this game. There, there were a lot of very, very strong individual performances. You mentioned Jennings and Batuli, and you also mentioned Warrior. I mean, Marquez Callaway had a, a phenomenal game. If, if Jennings doesn't have the game he does – we're sitting here talking about Callaway having a complete game because he had 100 yards receiving, a just beautiful a touchdown reception, a 55-yarder, and then a 65-yard punt return for a touchdown. I mean, he he was Tennessee's probably that was his performance he had. He was probably Tennessee's third best offensive player. I mean, you could argue maybe even a fourth depending on what you want you know where you want to rank J T. Stroud. But I I think you could put Garantano and Jennings ahead of Callaway, and Callaway still had a phenomenal game. I mean, that that to me shows just how good Tennessee was playing on Saturday where you had a guy who catched 
uh, you know, caught 100 yards in the game, a touchdown, returned a punt, and he wasn't your best offensive player. He might not even been your second best offensive player because Garantano played really well. Jennings obviously lights out. I mean, and then JT Stroud played well uh, defensively and, and special teams. And then uh, Petula well, was phenomenal. And then how, yeah, go ahead. Just real quick. And then how about we mentioned all these names and we didn't even mention the SEC offensive lineman of the yes, week, uh-huh. Brandon Kennedy made made people forget about Javon Kinlaw and Javon Kinlaw is going to be a first round pick and you know Trey Smith and Jerome Carvin also have you have to tip your hat to them as well and help you Brandon Kennedy but we mentioned all these great accolades and we didn't even mention Brandon Kennedy yeah and he he helped with the that his offensive line played very well in this game and, and Kennedy was probably the best one I think Trey Smith always had played really well too but you had Darnell Wright go out and he was out for the rest of the game once he left Wanya Morris came out and he was out for a while and then eventually did come back. But for a while there, you were playing without, you know, your two best freshmen and, and two of your better offensive linemen in the game. And Tennessee still, throughout the entire game, did not allow a single sack. It, it was the first time all season that South Carolina didn't get a sack in a game. And they came into this game with, I think, 17 team sacks. And I think three of their defensive linemen or three of their front seven guys were like in the top 10 in the conference and, and sacks or something like that. I mean, they were a, a you know, Pruitt was talking all week. Ben, you mentioned it in several different articles and, and podcasts and stuff that you know Pruitt was very effusive in his praise with uh, South Carolina's defensive line in their front seven, talking about it, it might be the best that Tennessee's played all season. And when you consider some of the teams Tennessee's played, like Florida, Georgia, and Alabama, that was, I mean, that's some huge praise. And then Tennessee's offensive line goes out there and does what they do. And obviously some of that also was on play calling. A, a lot of the passes were kind of uh, designed to not take a whole lot of time. But really, even if when the pocket did collapse, Tennessee's quarterbacks, I, th- I thought Shrout and Garantano both, showed really good awareness and really good pocket presence on Saturday. And you know, probably some of the best pocket presence we've seen from Garantano this season, maybe his entire Tennessee career. And I, and I thought Shrout did too. Um, let's go ahead and talk about those two because you mentioned the quarterback situation a little bit um, in, in your, your the initial answer there when I it turned it over to you. And I, that's one of the main things I want to talk about in this podcast. Ben, you and I both mentioned it in our prediction piece and, and I think in the podcast on Thursday of last week that we both would feel a lot better about picking Tennessee to win that game if Brian Mauer were starting. And then when Tennessee goes out and has their best team passing performance of the season, uh, by, you know, by yardage and everything, by, by any sort of metric you want to throw out there, 351 yards, three touchdowns, and most importantly, and this has been a big struggle for Tennessee this year, the quarterback position, no turnovers, no fumbles, no interceptions. Uh, nothing. Three touchdowns, 350 yards, and then never giving the ball away. That was very, very impressive. It was it was probably the most impressive passing performance of the Jeremy Pruitt era because, I mean, you could, you could throw in the Auburn game the last year, too, obviously. That one was still a little bit more just throwing the ball up, making letting your receivers make a play. On Saturday, there was some of that still, but a lot of it was also the quarterbacks making the right reads, the receivers doing their job and getting open. It was it was very impressive. You didn't just have Callaway and Jennings. You also had um, Josh Palmer get involved with the passing game, which that was really nice to see for him. Five catches, 55 yards, and I think at least two, if not three, of his catches um, were important first downs uh, for Tennessee too. I, I think Ben, one of the biggest takeaways from the game, besides the you know the the huge monster games from Jennings and Batuli and Kennedy having a good game, and as you mentioned, Warrior playing well too, and Neural Taylor also having a good game. I think the biggest thing was that Tennessee showed that, hey, they actually may have three quarterbacks who they can actually play and feel good about. I do think you feel less good about, well, I, I don't know. I, I, I think it's worth the conversation of having. Who, who do you feel the most confident in moving forward? Because I still think, I think a lot of all fans would say, I, I still think it's Brian Maurer, um, just based off of things we've seen when he's healthy, uh, just the way he, he plays out there, the way he's able to do some things with the offense that neither Shrout nor Maurer are able to do. I think a lot of people are, are maybe making a little bit too much of Shrout's performance because of, you know, the stat line's obviously really good. And what we saw, you know, he, he did play well, but he still, to me, I think he, he makes, I think they did a good job of controlling the offense when he was in there, of, of letting him kind of build up his, his confidence. And I don't really know how much more, if at all, he would have played if Garantano doesn't get hurt um, in that game. And I, I think the staff wanted to get him in there to, you know, I think maybe relieve some pressure off of Garantano and bring him in off, you know, and relief off the bench, so maybe you also lessen the booing he's going to get and stuff, because you know fans were were probably going to boo him. I don't, I don't really think it was that much. I don't think as much as we anticipated it being when he did come in the game. But Shrout did okay in the beginning, and then he he really did well in the second half when he took over. 
But I think ben, this this has to give you some confidence moving forward in the quarterback position. If you sustain another injury to Maurer, or if he can't go, if Garantano can't go, I feel like you you don't feel as in a bind with JT Shroud, and you also are able to you know put Jennings back there as a wildcat, put Tim Jordan back there as a wildcat, you know, kind of give him some some plays off and some time to you know, you're not just giving him all the responsibility. And I think Garantano turned a corner. You know, I thought, although we said this against Mississippi State, so maybe he, maybe he hits another one of those things where he's going to have a really good game if he has to come out and play against, you know, UAB or Kentucky or Missouri moving forward. Maybe he doesn't have a good game. But I, I almost wonder if, you know, Garantano is just a better player off the bench this season as, as opposed to being a starter. But in all of this, Ben, the whole point of, of me getting to kind of around this topic was what do you think Tennessee should do moving forward at quarterback? Because I, I agree with what. Garantano said after the game, he said there isn't really a competition, and I agree with him. I, I think if Maurer's healthy, he's your starter. I, I, I just think that is the case. I think the staff trusts Garantano to be the reliever in this situation, especially it, really a, a long reliever, too. He's a guy you can throw in, you know, to use the baseball analogy. He's a guy who I think they would trust that they're in there if the starter, you know, has a bad outing or gets hurt and it's a third inning, fourth inning, and you need a guy to come in there and absorb three or four more innings before you get to the, you know, the shorter relief in your in your bullpen. I think they would trust Garantano to do that. I just don't know if they trust him to be the the full time starter. I, I, I if me if it's me, and I think Pruitt has alluded to this too. I think Mauer's your starter moving forward still as long as he's healthy, and I, I think you feel good about your backup options now a lot better than you did, um, you know, two three weeks ago with you know the way Shrout and Garantano both played against South Carolina. Yeah, if if you were to tell me that Jared Garantano was going to play against uh UAB, Kentucky, Missouri, and Vanderbilt the way he did on Saturday, then Jared Garantano is your starter. And I'm not saying that because obviously he threw for two hundred and something yards and two touchdowns, then it turned the football over. But that was the Jared Garantano that the coaches saw in fall camp and expected to play to start mm-hmm. the year. And Jeremy Pruitt alluded to that uh, during his Monday press conference, saying or talking about the, the throw to Juwan Jennings where Juwan caught the touchdown in the back back of the end zone, and he was absolutely laid out. I mean, just took a humongous hit, a terrific catch. But on that play, Jeremy Pruitt was effusive in his praise for Garantano because on that play, he shifted the protection – he knew that there was going to be a man unaccounted for, and he kind of scrambled out of the pocket away from that side and threw it to only where Juwan could go up and catch the football. And on top of that, he knew he was going to take a hit. So, And, and on top of that, he was able to communicate the offensive line shifts and everything that he needed to communicate to the offensive linemen, to the running backs, to the receivers, and it resulted in a touchdown. That was the J.G., that the coach you saw in fall camp, that was the the JG that was supposed to show up against Georgia State, against BYU, against Florida, against UTC. Uh, that was the JG that was supposed to show up. So, if you tell me that that JG is going to play the rest of the year, the one that has uh, command of the offense, the one who is, you know, locked in, engaged. Uh, has the trust of his teammates, and I think he does have the trust of his teammates now that he came out and apologized last Sunday following the Alabama game for his for his play at the goal line. He apologized to his to his teammates and he apologized to his coaches. And I know for a fact that he wasn't forced to do that. That was JG wanting to do it on his own. And obviously, I mean, it, obviously it was the the right thing to do. It needed to be done, but he didn't have to have somebody force him to get up there and do it he didn't have to have somebody tell him to get up there and do it he did it on his own accord and that to a certain extent won the teammates back over and I thought you saw that on Saturday so again if if the JG that has command of the offense is locked in is communicating well um, is thinking correctly pre-snap during the snap obviously during the play reading his progressions not missing wide open receivers which was the huge thing that that really you know got him in 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 the doghouse is he was missing so many wide open receivers and I, I still think that Maurer is more prone to turn the football over. Just go back and watch the Mississippi State game and those red zone interceptions in the end zone. I, I still think Maurer is more prone to turning the football over. But the biggest reason why the coaches felt comfortable going with Maurer over JG for that Georgia game was because 
if Tennessee did have a wide open receiver, Maurer wasn't going to miss him. And, and if he did miss him, it, it might have been once a game. And obviously once a game is too much, but JG was missing three, four, five, six guys wide open uh, per game. And yep. you saw it against BYU. It cost them 21 to 24 points. Tennessee should have won that game 35 to 13. I went back and I counted it. And then Jeremy Pruitt has also talked about how they left three to four scores on the field in that BYU game. So uh, if the JG that that isn't missing wide receivers and isn't turning the football over, if he's going to show up for the month of November, I ride with JG. Because if that JG shows up, I, I guarantee Tennessee goes 4-0. and And I, I'm not trying to, to knock Maurer and me kind of, I guess you could say, promoting JG or giving my thoughts on JG. But... I, again, I still think because Maurer is the freshman, uh, Maurer would would tend to be more in or more turnover prone and obviously injury prone at this point. I would consider rolling with JG, but it's also a huge risk, and I get that because right now it's kind of a small sample size of JG playing the way that he did. It's really the second half of Mississippi State, um, and I guess what two quarters against Alabama and Pruitt was very adamant that JG actually played a good football game if you look beyond the box score if you look beyond uh, his red zone fumble or his fumble at the goal line and if you look beyond him missing Juwan wide open for a touchdown if you look beyond that JG actually played well against Alabama and had command of the offense Uh, and that showed again against Mississippi State so honestly I think I would go I would go with JG but I would have a, a, a quick pool. If he starts to show those signs of uh, what he was struggling with earlier in the year, then I would definitely uh, put Maurer in there. But to your point, I, I don't think Tennessee can go wrong at the moment. It may prove to be wrong in hindsight, but at the moment, uh, especially against UAB, I don't think that there's going to be an incorrect decision. But uh, against Kentucky, I don't know that you can make a bad decision. I, I do think that JG and Maurer are better options than Shrout. Uh, I, I do believe that, but in terms of picking between JG and Maurer, uh, I don't think you can make a bad decision. And whichever one you do go with, I think obviously you won't communicate this to that player, but they'll have a, a short leash. If, if Maurer goes out and throws two red zone, end zone interceptions in the first quarter, JG's probably going to get in the game if jg goes out there for the first three series and he misses three wide open guys or he turns the football over or he's not recognizing the blitzes not shifting the offensive line protection then mauer is going to go in there so i think you kind of play it by ear um but uh, overall i don't think you can make a, a bad decision yeah i mean that that was that was you know kind of my point too is that i don't know that you that you feel really bad about your options now because have good options that you, you know more about Shrout now because he was able to get there and play, um, you know, in one series against Alabama, but he played several series against South Carolina. And as we said, I mean, he looked good. Um, he, he did not look bad. There, there were still times you could tell they were, you know, making the offense a little more basic with him in there. And they obviously, the only time Jennings was used as a wildcat was when he was in there. I, I don't think, I could be wrong, but I don't think Jennings was really used much, if at all, in that wildcat role uh, with Garantano in there. Uh, but they definitely did it with Shroud in there because they wanted to take more responsibility off of him. I mean, obviously you saw Jennings take the first two snaps, or he took the first snap at quarterback, and then Shroud took the snap at quarterback and then gave it to Jennings to throw on the second play. But they, it was obvious that they were, you know, not that they didn't trust Shroud, that is they knew his limitations more and were trying to, you know, alleviate the responsibility and their pressure off him. And when Garitano was in there, they, they trusted him more and they didn't ask you know Jennings to do a whole lot besides be a pass catcher and it worked out very well for him it worked out very well for Tennessee's offense too I, I still think you go with Bauer moving forward if he's healthy I, I you know maybe could understand resting him against UAB but at the same time though I mean this UAB team's good I mean it, you know I think a lot of all fans are not going to overlook them because of or, you know or overlook them as much because of the way the season started I, I think if this if Tennessee beats Georgia State it beats BYU. This is obviously a totally different conversation. I think fans are overlooking UAB to get ready for Missouri, but this UAB team seven and one for a reason. They actually have a really good defense. Um, I don't have the stats in front of me, but I know you know Clark is as a former defensive guy. Pruitt knows him really well, and Pruitt knows, knows a lot of the guys over in that UAB staff. Um, he mentioned that in his press conference on Monday too. 
Uh, maybe that familiar, familiarity will help, but it, it wouldn't surprise me, honestly, if this game's you know fairly low scoring. I don't know if Tennessee will will come out and just blow UAB out of the water. It, it could be a, a like a 24-10 type of game or something like that where Tennessee wins. It just maybe doesn't look all that pretty. Um, but at the same time, though, UAB could win because UAB, they don't have a great offense. That, that's kind of the thing I, I would hold off on and saying why they, they won't beat Tennessee, why they won't be a Georgia State against Tennessee is because I don't think they have the same type of offense that Georgia State does. Um, and not that Georgia State's offense you know, should have been able to do what they did against Tennessee, um, but they have more options and, and, and a, you know, a little bit more dynamic quarterback play than what um, UAB has. But UAB does have a really good defense, so... I, I you know I don't know maybe you sit Mauer for this game just to make sure he's healthy because concussions are they're nothing to be played with and uh, Pruitt did seem pretty optimistic on Monday that um, you know when speaking to media that that Mauer would be able to go he said he'd be ready to go they said he will practice today uh, on Monday and, and that they'll kind of see where he is as the week goes on so he seemed kind of optimistic about it um, so maybe you know maybe it does happen but. If you can't play him or if you don't want to play him, I, I, you're feeling pretty good about Garantano. Uh, I mean, you're feeling pretty good about if Garantano can't play, that you have JT Stroud that can that can back him up. So I think finally we've seen all these guys play, and I think we kind of all finally know, hey, this isn't bad. And you also wonder with Stroud, just like we wondered, you, you and I have been, we wondered after the Georgia game with Mauer, was that just kind of a one-off thing? Is, is that kind of a flash in the pan a little bit with, with Shrout? Will he be able to do that against Missouri? Will he be able to do that against Kentucky if he if he's asked to play against those two teams? Or even a UAB defense, that I think is pretty good too. So that'll be interesting to see kind of who gets the playing time, who gets the starting nod, because obviously who gets the starting nod doesn't mean that's who's going to play the most because – Mauer's got the start the last three weeks before this past weekend, and he didn't play the most in two of those three starts. Garantano played, you know, over half the game against Mississippi State, over half the game against Alabama. So, just because you start doesn't mean you're going to be getting the most reps at this point with Tennessee at quarterback. But it, it is nice to know uh, for the Vols and for Vol fans out there that hey, there's you know, as long as Garantano keeps his head straight and and the injury for his his wrist isn't that bad, which make it sound like it's not that bad. Uh, you got to feel pretty decent about the quarterback situation, which a month ago, I mean, it seemed like Tennessee had zero quarterbacks on the roster that were going to do anything for you this year. You had two freshmen who hadn't played really much at all except against UTC. You had a struggling veteran who seemed like he didn't belong on the roster at that point. Now you feel like you have three guys who can get you wins in, in the SEC because they all three have gotten you wins in the SEC this season. So uh, that that to me is... All these other things, talk about the improvement of the offensive line, talk about the improvement of the defensive line, talk about the improvement of some individuals like, you know, Nigel Warrior um, and, and, and other guys like that, and along with the offensive line and defensive lines too. I think another big revelation is that Tennessee has a quarterback. And they don't just have one. They have a couple guys that uh, – they have a couple guys who, you, you, you know, you feel fine with playing. And then all of that goes into, I think, this greater conversation of now Tennessee is 3-5. and five. They're looking at their schedule with four games remaining. All four games are winnable. And I, I don't think Tennessee will be favorite in all four. I think obviously they'll be favorites against UAB and against Vanderbilt. And you know they, they should be favorites in those games. And it could maybe depends on what happens between now and, and you know a couple weeks from now. But you can maybe make the case, too, that Tennessee will be a favorite um, in Lexington when they play Kentucky. It just kind of depends on Kentucky's quarterback situation, if you know what what's going on with them there. But... All four games are winnable. Even if Tennessee isn't a favorite in, in all four of them, they should be able to at least get two, if not three victories. And if you get three victories in your next four, you're going bowling. So to me, Ben, I'm going to ask your percentage chance on what Tennessee making a bowl is because I, I've got some stats pulled up here from, you know, different the projections and stuff I mentioned, I think, in last week's podcast maybe. Or it was two weeks ago, I think, actually, what I, what I listened to. It was, it was before the Bama game, talking about, their percentage chances of beating the rest of the teams on their their schedule and stuff, but uh, Tennessee's bowl chances, in my opinion, have jumped up significantly after this win against South Carolina because that 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 one you could argue South Carolina or Missouri were were the two toughest teams left on Tennessee's schedule, and Tennessee pretty well handled South Carolina. So you know I I want to see some consistency, and I'll kind of get into that here in a little bit. But Tennessee some they've shown some consistency here the last three weeks and have played a lot better. Really, the last four weeks, I think they, they played better against Georgia. It just didn't show in the final score. But Ben, if you had to put a number on it, and, and obviously feel free to explain the number, but if you had to put a number on it, where'd you put Tennessee's bowl chances right now? Yeah, their bowl chances of you know just getting six and six, and also their chances of completely winning out and getting seven and five. 
Uh, well, going back real quick to uh, UAB's defense. Statistically, yes. they are the fifth best defense in the country. They are only allowing 248.6 yards per game. Uh, their their scoring defense ranks 11th in the country. They're only allowing 15 points per game. Um, running the football, eighth in the country, 88 yards per game, and then passing defense is seventh in the country at 160.3 yards per game. So that UAB defense is pretty stout, and that's why they are six and one on the season and three and one in conference USA. And then uh, offensively, you kind of mentioned it they don't have the offensive firepower that that they did a season ago but they have receivers uh as jeremy pruitt mentioned uh today during his press conference that they look like sec wide receivers austin watkins 655 655 yards on the season five touchdowns uh and then kendall parham 518 yards and six touchdowns on the season they are they are very good and uh their, their quarterback tyler johnson uh, 109 for 181, 60 percent completion percentage, 1700 yards, 15 touchdowns to 10 interceptions. So uh, the offense is going to have its work cut out for you. So it is very important that they uh, decide, you know, or make the right decision uh, to, for which quarterback will play. But mm-hmm. in terms of making a bowl game, I mean, I know, I'm sure my percentage will be way off uh, from my ESPN's FPI projections. But in my mind. Tennessee should absolutely beat Kentucky, should absolutely beat UAB, and should absolutely beat Vanderbilt. And with the way that Missouri is playing, they should beat Missouri. Now, uh, that game still scares me. It's on the road. Tennessee hasn't played well in Columbia traditionally. Uh, Kelly Bryant, if he is healthy, I know he's battling a hamstring injury at the moment, but if he's healthy, uh, he could present Tennessee some problems if he's able to, to run around. They have a tight end, Albert O., uh, who could be a potential nightmare matchup for Tennessee's yeah. linebackers. Tennessee's linebackers have not been good in coverage this year, so he could pre- present some problems. Uh, they are physical along the offensive line, and then their running back, Larry Roundtree, uh, is a very talented running back. So there are some some facets to the Missouri game that scare me. But ultimately, with the way that they're playing, I don't blame people for expecting Tennessee to win. So, um as of today, I would probably say Tennessee wins out just because I do think at the moment, uh, October 28th, I believe that is today, it is October 28th, um, Tennessee is better than UAB, Tennessee is better than Kentucky, Tennessee is better than Missouri, and Tennessee is better than Vanderbilt. So I do think it's fair to expect Tennessee to win out, but and I think they will win out just based off of that simple fact that Tennessee is better than all four of those teams as of today. But I wouldn't put the percentage at like 100% because it's definitely not guaranteed. Uh, I would probably put the percentage around 60% uh, just because you do have two tough road games at Kentucky, at Missouri, back-to-back. You do have a bye week in between, but those are still two tough road contests. Uh, Lynn Bowden Jr. uh, is a wide receiver playing quarterback, but he is a very talented football player, and that's really all that matters. He he has been incredible running the football uh, and Tennessee has done better at stopping the run against Mississippi State and against South Carolina, but it, it, it has also been a problem at other times this year. And with a dual-threat quarterback, that that really presents some challenges. So uh, I do think Tennessee wins, but it's definitely not a guarantee. I've already kind of talked about Missouri. Uh, I've already talked up UAB and Vanderbilt as wins, uh, quite frankly. So uh, I think Kentucky and Missouri, if they don't win both, they definitely split both uh, between the Kentucky and Missouri game. I'd be shocked if they lost both of them. So uh, I would put Tennessee's chances at making a bowl game 80, 85, 90%, at least getting the six wins. And then uh, in terms of winning out, I would probably put it at, uh, you know, 60 to 70% somewhere in there just because that is a, a tall task, even if Tennessee is better than all four teams left on the schedule. I think before I get my percentage, I want to give what some of these uh... – these analytics and stuff, what their kind of algorithms have projected. I've mentioned both these on the podcast before. Obviously, the ESP and FPI gets a ton of attention from everybody. Um, they, they've they've upped Tennessee's chances of winning games quite a bit um, since Tennessee you know beat South Carolina. They're now favorites against UAB and Vanderbilt, kind of uh, kind of equal there, eighty eight percent against UAB, eighty six percent against Vanderbilt. So that, those are you know Tennessee heavy favorites in both those games. Um, despite we we would talk about UAB having some really good. Um, 
players and really good defense and stuff, there's Tennessee still favored pretty heavily in that contest. Against Kentucky, Tennessee, I think, earlier this year, even after their 0-2 star, I think were still favored to beat Kentucky, but now it's closer to a toss-up. Um, they actually are kind of underdogs in the FPI. They're given a 40.3% chance of beating Kentucky. Um, I think that's that's partially to do with you know Kentucky's you know still playing well for the most part, even without Cyrus Smith at quarterback. In fact, they might be better off without Cyrus Smith at quarterback. It might be better for Tennessee if Cyrus Smith is healthy and they put him at quarterback <laughs> uh, rather than having Lynn Bowden back there. And then Tennessee has a 36.2% chance of beating Missouri. I think part of those also are because both those games are on the road. Um, and, I, you know, I think they, they give the advantage, obviously, more to the home team. And Missouri's been a lot better of a home team this year than a away team. So I'll be, I would be very interested to see kind of what Missouri does between now and that game because that's still actually, weirdly enough, it's like a month away. And it's, you know, t- Tennessee feels like it's, it should be closer than that. But they have, again, they this will be the third straight road game after they're on a bye week this week, but their next game will be at Georgia. So they'll, they'll play three straight road games um, by the time they play Georgia because they'll play at Vanderbilt, which is a loss, at Kentucky, which was a loss, and they'll play at Georgia. All their losses this year have been away from uh, the Columbia, Missouri. They, they lost to Wyoming to start the season at Wyoming, and they won all the, the, the next five games, or was it the five? Yeah, next five games, and they're all at home against West Virginia, uh, SEMO, uh, South Carolina, Troy, Ole Miss. They don't have a road game after the Georgia game until their last game of the season against Arkansas. So they play, they go at Georgia against Florida, against Tennessee. And then Tennessee, meanwhile, comes off a bye week. So that, I mean, it, it sets up very interestingly for that game where it's at home where Missouri plays better, but Missouri will be coming off playing two top 10 teams with Georgia and Florida and back to back weeks. So they're going to they, imagine they're pretty beat up physically in that game, too. So. You already got Kelly Bryant kind of injured and everything too, and I mean Missouri just does not have a good backup option behind him. But to go to the to the FBI, that that's you know giving the percentage chances there of of each game, the FBI gives Tennessee actually a ten point nine percent chance of winning out, which is higher than I expected it to be, and it was higher than it was just a couple weeks ago. Um, but they're they're giving you know right around an eleven percent chance of winning out, and right now the projected win loss on the FBI is a 5.5 wins and 6.5 losses. So they're hovering around, it's right between a 5-7 and seven and a 6-6 six and six record. So the FBI doesn't want to predict it one way or the other. It has it at 5.5 wins, 6.5 losses. So you're right in the middle of, it, that swing game is going to be the Kentucky game, it looks like, just based off of you know their projections and everything. Is, is, you know, if Tennessee beats Kentucky, they'll go 6-6 six and six at least. If Tennessee loses to Kentucky, uh, the FBI probably thinks Tennessee will go 5-7. and seven. On TeamRankings.com, which I've mentioned before, I actually use this site quite a bit um, in basketball season because they do a lot of good bracket stuff and a lot of good uh, projections that way. Right now, they give Tennessee a 46% chance of being bowl eligible. When Tennessee, before the Georgia game, Tennessee had a 5% chance on Team Rankings of getting to a bowl game. So that is a, a significant jump. It's still less. It's still kind of a little bit below a 50-50 odds at this point that they'll they'll get bowl eligibility according to Team Rankings. But that's a lot better than you were, you know, a month ago at this point uh, in the season after after the Florida game. So 46% chance of getting bowl eligibility. Tennessee, again, just like the FBI in this one, 88% chance of beating both UAB and Vanderbilt, a 37.7% chance of beating Kentucky, and a 27.9% chance of beating Missouri, which is up, I think, about 3% a percentage chance points than it was a couple weeks ago. I think probably the same thing for Kentucky, if I remember correctly. Um, they have Tennessee's best odds of, of what the record will be at the end of the season is 5-7, and seven, with a 40.9% chance probability of that being what Tennessee's record will be. A 35.7% chance it'll be 6-6, six and six, and then a 10.2% chance Tennessee wins out. So it's very similar, actually, to what ESPN's FBI says. Uh, a 10.2% chance Tennessee goes 7-5, and five, which would be winning out. So my my answer, Ben, of... of what I think Tennessee's chances of winning out and what I think their chances of getting to a bowl game both are. I think a bowl game to me is upwards of 75 to 80% at this point. Uh, like you said, I don't feel great about saying 100% on, on either one of these things, but I feel I feel very, I would say pretty confident at this point that Tennessee will make a bowl game. It, it would be, at this point, with the way Tennessee has played the last three weeks, it would be surprising to me if they didn't make a bowl game. And no, at the same time, winning... Yeah, with, with with the same time with winning out, um, I, I don't know that I feel super confident in Tennessee winning out just because, as you mentioned, 
Missouri still kind of worries me playing them at home, but I, I would still say it's a good, to me, a good 40% chance. I'd still say less than 50 because, I mean, maybe I'm just being a little negative on that one. But my, my hesitancy is this. Looking at last season, after the Kentucky win, we were all talking about, we are all kind of saying the same thing we are saying now. And obviously this is earlier in the season, the, the, the Kentucky game last year. That win with the Wildcats, you know, Tennessee was 5-5 five and five coming off, as you said earlier, Ben, what you thought was the best game you know, of the Jerry and Pruitt era just as a, as a team and the way they handled um, Kentucky and, and just, I mean, they manhandled them. They held them to seven points, so that was that was very impressive. We all were thinking, hey, Tennessee, even if they lose to Missouri, they should be able to go out and beat Vanderbilt uh, in that game, and, and, and they, they didn't just lose. They lost big time. I don't, I don't think that'll happen this season because you've seen Tennessee play better consistently. That game was a little bit kind of one-off. Tennessee had played well against South Carolina, uh, a couple weeks prior and obviously lost and then they had just that just clunker of a game where they, they obviously beat Charlotte but it was just one of the ugliest games I've ever seen in my entire life so it wasn't like they had played super well the, the, the previous two games before playing Kentucky and that you know in hindsight that was kind of a, a one-off game this South Carolina game doesn't feel like a one-off game it, it feels like a culmination of Tennessee making more and more progress each and every week since the bye week. I, I think, you know, a lot of people will point, if Tennessee goes to bowl game or if Tennessee wins out and goes 7-5, and five, a lot of people will point to this game as kind of the turning point. I'm, I would point to the Georgia game as the turning point and saying that was the game where Tennessee took steps to getting to where, you know, they finish the season if they go 7-5 and five or even 6-6 six and six, and saying, hey, that was the game where Tennessee really started to show progress to me in, in a lot of different areas with the offensive line, uh, obviously with the quarterback play, with, with just kind of the mentality overall in that game. And then obviously it came out and you beat Mississippi State the next week, and that was a, that was a big win. They played so very tough against Alabama and just had a lot of things not go their way. Part of it was their own fault, but then part of it wasn't their fault. And then, you know, still lost by 22, but that was a lot closer than what you and I and everyone else were expecting for that game. And then come out and just dominate South Carolina in the second half. And Tennessee's shown more consistency I still want to see it in November. November's been a struggle for Tennessee over the last few years when it when it hadn't, hasn't been historically, but since 2016, Tennessee has very much struggled in the month of November to you know to, to beat the South Carolinas, to beat the Missouris, to beat the Kentuckys, to even beat the Vanderbilts um, the last three years. To me, they they've got to show it in November that they this, that they can carry this over and not just play well for three weeks, but play well for four, five, six, seven weeks. And and if you if you don't play well against UAB, you can still probably get a victory in that one. If you don't play well against Missouri, against Kentucky, you may not win those games. If you don't play well against Vanderbilt, I mean, you may not win. You should still win that game even if you play ugly, but that, that's not a guarantee with the way things have gone the last three years. So to me, Ben, I, I still want to see Tennessee play better in November, and I, I think they will. I think this team is is doing better at this point of the season than last, the last team was, and they've shown more consistency um, at any point this, at this season than they did at any point last year. But I, I still, before I make a you know a, a really big bold claim about them making you know finishing the season go, winning out, I, I still think they'll obviously get to a bowl game. But I, I, I'm a little more hesitant about saying they'll win out just because I, I kind of want to see it before I believe it. No, I, I'm with you, and I mean I have that same hesitancy. Uh, but I think the biggest thing, and you kind of, you said it there a second ago, is that this Tennessee football team is is better than the Tennessee football team from last year. And Jeremy Pruitt said, said you know, a couple of weeks ago that this football team is 100 times better than last year's team, and he was kind of mocked for it, but he was absolutely telling the truth. This football team is better. Look at the offensive line. Look at the receivers. Look at the tight ends. Look at the running backs. Uh, I, don't, I don't think I'd say quarterbacks, but you can even look at the defense and how the secondary has gotten better and – uh, the defensive front with the linebackers and the defensive line has gotten better. Uh, secondary, I mean, uh, special teams has continued to improve. So I think that should give people confidence that Tennessee will make a bowl game. And ultimately, that is the goal. People w will be frustrated if Tennessee were to win out, if Tennessee were to get to six wins. Then they'll say, well, th this should have been an eight and four win football team. Or if they went out, people will say this should have been a nine and three football team. Georgia State and or Georgia State and BYU should have been wins, and I, I will understand that frustration. But after the one and three, one and four start, and you lose to Georgia State, making a bowl game is a minor miracle. This football team has improved leaps and bounds. So yes. um, th there is some nervousness to uh, betting on Tennessee making a bowl game. 
because of the way they finished last year to Missouri and to Vanderbilt. But here's another thing to also remember in the sense of Tennessee is better and Vanderbilt and Missouri are worse than they were last year. Yeah. Uh, they are they are absolutely worse. Uh, down the stretch, Tennessee had to play that Kentucky football team. That was really good last year. Kentucky, Missouri, Vanderbilt, UAB, none of those teams are that good. So Tennessee has gotten better, and the month of November has gotten weaker for, for Tennessee in terms of the overall ability of its opponents. So Tennessee, just whatever you do, it just has to find a way to, to win three out of these next four games. And I, I think it is absolutely do, doable. I think it should be the expectation uh, not making a bowl game. Uh, will be an absolute failure, uh, and that's really just because, like I said earlier, Tennessee's better than all four of the football teams as of today. So it, it will be very disappointing, uh, but th- th- we don't have a small sample size to work off of. Last year we had one game to work off of going into the Missouri and, and Vanderbilt game, and that was the Kentucky performance. Right now we've got four straight, you know, um, games of evidence of this football team being better playing better football uh the georgia game wasn't a complete game but the first half they go out and they beat mississippi state uh three and a half quarters against alabama the entire game against south carolina there's there's a long list of evidence supporting tennessee being an above average football team and if you are an above average football team against kentucky Vanderbilt, UAB, Missouri, you're going to win those games assuming that you play at your best and the, the other teams play at their best because those teams are average at best. You know, Tennessee's above average in my opinion, uh, and I think that their record at the end of the year will prove that, whereas Missouri's just a meh football team, Kentucky is a meh football team, Vanderbilt's a terrible football team, and, and sure, UAB is 6-1 and one on the season, they are not a team Tennessee should take lightly, but at the end of the day, it's a Conference USA opponent. They don't have a Mark West Callaway. They don't have a Daryl Taylor, a Henry Toto, you know, guys like that. So uh, Tennessee should absolutely make a bowl game. That should be the expectation, and anything less is a failure. And I, I have confidence that they're going to do it, mainly because of the coaching staff. We talk about, you know, the sample size of the players and their performance. What about the performance of the coaches? Jim Chaney yeah. might have been the best offensive coordinator in the SEC for the month of October. What he did against Georgia and Mississippi State and South Carolina and Alabama, all while dealing with a terrible quarterback situation, was just really impressive. And then look at the defensive side of the ball. Jeremy Pruitt and Derek Ansley, their defense have continued to improve and improve and improve. Their calls have always been spot on. It's just players weren't executing. Now the players are executing, and they're able to call more things and confuse teams such as South Carolina in the second half and they pitch a shutout in the second half so the players are getting getting better the coaches are getting better and I have confidence that this team will make a bowl game I have confidence to make a bowl game for sure um, like I said I, I'm just a little more hesitant on the winning out part but I, I, I'm like I said I'm right there 75 80 maybe even a little bit higher uh, percent chance of, of Tennessee getting to a bowl game no I, that's obviously a little bit different than what the analytics say but we, we've seen the analytics be very wrong on Tennessee um, in the past and this specifically this season too with with uh, different games against Georgia State, against um, BYU, but positively too against against you know Alabama. The, no one was giving Tennessee a chance in that game, and yet Tennessee makes it closer, and it was closer even than what the final score um, indicated in that game too. But there are a lot more things we can talk about, and, and then we just don't have time because <laughs> unfortunately I can't sit there and go on forever. But there is just a lot of positivity. We'll probably talk about it a little bit more uh, later this week too, and in, in, in the second podcast. You know, still kind of talking about some of the positives from this game and looking ahead to the UAB game as well. But th- th- this was a much-needed win, not just for Tennessee's bowl chances, but kind of for the psyche of the van- the fans because, I mean, it wasn't just that Tennessee won. And I-, I wrote about this in a column on RockyTopInsider.com as well. It was just the way they won. It- with the dominance they had, with the fact that you didn't have your starting quarterback and you played really three quarterbacks in the entire game and still did what you did on offense – the way they just controlled South Carolina on defense, uh, especially winning the the battle of the line of scrimmage on both ends. Tennessee won the battle of the line of scrimmage on both sides of the ball. Tennessee, you know, made the most plays on special teams. They got two touchdowns on special teams. So I, I think this win was important for a multitude of reasons. Um, you know, I don't know where you'd rank it, but I think you know, getting getting that win is is very very important for their bowl, their bowl hopes. And right now. 
tennis who's trending in the right direction to get to bowl game. And as you said, I, I think that's an interesting conversation to have if or when it happens. You have Tennessee go six and six or seven and five, and talking about you know what if Tennessee did beat Georgia State and BYU should you know should fans be upset about that or not? I, I think it's a conversation we'll have to have at a later date, but I think that's that's definitely one that would be good to have if Tennessee gets to that point. But right now, Tennessee three and five. They have two SEC wins. They have four SEC wins last two seasons, which is the same amount of wins they had in 2016 and 2017 under Butch Jones. Oh, that, that's <laughs> I, I thought about that earlier today and thought, I mean, that's a little bit of skewing numbers, but it's just interesting to think about. But well, that'll go ahead and do it for this episode of the podcast. Uh, we do appreciate all of you listening and all of you who read our stuff on, on the website. Uh, ben and I both do a lot of hard work for writing uh, for rockettopinsider.com. So we really appreciate you guys reading that stuff and, and sharing it everything as well we do a lot of hard work for the podcast here as well so we, we are very thankful for all of you who listen to the podcast whether it's you know kind of the traditional podcast way or if you watch it so I'll listen to it on youtube as well however you're doing it uh we're very thankful we're very appreciative and i know uh, ben and jason swain are also very happy that you all listen to this one event where, where ben is on there every single morning as the co-host and producer of that show as well but we thank you all again for listening to this episode of the RTI podcast. We'll be back later on this week. And until next time, this has been another episode of the RTI podcast.